So when we talk about minstrel shows, normally the first thing that pops into one's mind is this image. So this is Justin Trudeau, the president of Canada, in blackface. Hey Skinny! The minstrel show's coming to town! Beginning in the 1840s, the minstrel show was America's first entertainment craze. It started with northern white performers who observed blacks or Negroes or slaves at that point um, really entertaining themselves. Say, I have an idea. Yes. You be around here about a half hour before the show. You mean you're going to let me watch up close? Jim Crow, you'll practically be right on the stage. Woo! Wheel about and turn about, Jim Jim. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Give me back my clothes, please. What they did was to imitate some of the actions they saw, some of the songs that they saw these slaves singing, and to put on uh, grease paint or blackface. Blacks had little power to protest their characterizations. Although many tried, whites could parody them, but they could parody no one but themselves. The Minstrel Show. So before I discuss the well-known aspects of it, I want to first discuss some of the history, a couple of the not-so-well-known facts about this art form and how it evolved. So Minstrel Shows, what were they? So let's do a little history. First thing, they were America's first pop craze. These things were popular from the West Coast to the East Coast. And they began in around 1843 when a man named Daddy Rice, he observed a slave named Jim Crow was singing and dancing. So Daddy Rice decided to create a vaudeville act around what he saw. So over time, this idea would catch on and it would become the most popular performance style in the United States and it would last for well over 100 years. The first big minstrel hit was written down and performed by a white man known as Daddy Rice, who said he'd first heard it being sung by a black stable hand. Rice named the tune after the man, Jim Crow. So typically in a minstrel show, the performers played characters who were just racial stereotypes of black culture. They would put on black face paint, and typically this left their lips white. And in later years, they would use white makeup to put on their lips to have the contrast of the black face and the white lips. New Orleans theaters also featured minstrel music. So-called plantation songs, written by white, and black songwriters, performed by whites blacked up as blacks, and sometimes in later years, by blacks blacked up as whites playing blacks. On the surface, minstrelsy seemed simply to reinforce ugly racial stereotypes. Within a few months of Daddy Rice creating this art form, the blackface craze took off in the United States it was sparked by the creation of a couple of stage characters named Zip Coon and Sambo. They became popular along with a new type of song that was sweeping the United States called the Coon Song. Oh, they turned their own minstrel shows into vaudeville, but blackface characterizations were still an essential part of the act. That's what the minstrels are here for. So At the same time, African Americans were being lynched by the hundreds and shunned by mainstream society. 
they were the subjects of the most popular music of the time, so-called coon songs, that like minstrel shows, depicted black life as free, careless, and non-threatening to anyone. So these minstrel troops were popular, and like I said earlier, they were popular from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast of the United States. They were really the first form of art to make black music and black people and black culture the essence of American pop culture. So what does this mean? Art based on minstrel shows became the rave. There were cups, dolls, and even a children's book teaching the ABCs as they were told in Dixie. But the lives of black people were not being portrayed accurately. Instead, it was a blend of riddles, jokes, and gags with music and dance that tended to make black people look foolish and often uneducated. Today, historians credit minstrel shows as being the first conduit for integration of black culture into American life. Okay, let's stop for a moment and examine more closely what this quote says. Today, historians credit minstrel shows as being the first conduit for integration of black culture into American life. So this happened because all the minstrel performing troops did the same routines using the same sambo and zip tune type characters who sang the same songs and told the same jokes no matter whether they were in Boston or whether they were in Los Angeles. Many of these songs and jokes are still part of the general American culture today and we give little thought of where they came from and their origins. Oh, as long as night and morning, you go back to the Minstrelsy was the most uh, popular form of American entertainment for about 80 years in the United States, beginning in the 1840s. It produced the first body of serious pop songs, Stephen Foster, James Bland, others, songs that we still, all of us to this day, know. It produced a national humor that we all know. Why did the chicken cross the road? Who is that woman I saw you with last night? Because you had minstrel troops very much codified, all doing the same kinds of songs, same kinds of humor, crisscrossing the whole country, not just into major cities, but to all kinds of towns, any place where there was a hall where they could perform, it was like early television. It was the first entertainment form that everybody in the United States knew. Everybody heard the same songs. Everybody heard the same jokes. This had never happened before, and it wouldn't really happen again until the movies. So we have to wonder, why did the minstrel show become so popular in the United States? Well, there are many reasons making this a complicated and tough question to answer. However, I do have a video clip of Wynton Marcellus, and he's stating his opinion about why minstrel music became not only a typical form of performing art that was popular, but the essence of all American culture there for a while. While there were so many dolls, books, uh, figurines, and other aspects of minstrel art penetrating itself into all aspects of American life. So watch this clip of Winston Marcellus and his opinion. Despite its overt racism, the minstrel show was a blend of lively music, knockabout comedy, and sophisticated elegance. A bizarre and complicated ritual in which blacks and whites alike would interpret and misinterpret each other for decades. I think that there's something that was so resilient in the black people and that everyone in America could recognize that resilience. And even though it was masquerading, uh, farce and comedy and dance and a form of music, and it seemed like it was uncomplimentary. Actually, there was something centrally American about it. 
And that was the beginning of a long relationship between blacks and whites and black entertainment and white appropriation of it. And this strange dance that we've been doing with each other since really the beginning of our relationship in America. It's too close, it's too deep a story. So you have to degrade the relationship. You have to do degrading things so that you can live with the tremendous affront to humanity that slavery was. We need to take a moment and stop to try to understand what Mr. Marcellus is telling us. I've created a bulleted list with his basic talking points. He starts off by talking about the easy-to-see resilience in the black people of the time. He says that hidden behind the comedy, song, and dance that was typical in minstrel show performances, there was something uncomplimentary yet essentially American about them. He continues to say that minstrel shows created the environment where the different races would start working with and against each other in a dance that would last for decades. The last thing Mr. Marcellus discusses is his opinion on why minstrel shows became so popular in the United States. This is a direct quote. It's too close. It's too deep a story. So you have to degrade the relationship. You have to do degrading things so you can live with the tremendous affront to humanity that slavery was. So, what does this mean? What is Mr. Marcellus trying to tell us with this quote? In my opinion, he is trying to say that American society at the time was drawn to the myth that minstrel shows provided. They were embarrassed about being part of a society that accepted for so long the stain of slavery. Essentially, he is saying that America used minstrel shows to make itself feel better for being part of a country that allowed slavery. So since minstrel shows lasted for almost 120 years, not all of their portrayals of black people was always negative. Many, especially the ones being produced in the 1940s and the 1950s for the big film industry and the big screen, kept the black face and the white lips but the productions became more Vegas in their production style. So let's take a look at a clip. Notice that the men in blackface are singing and dancing without any use of the simple comedy and the zip coon or sambo type stereotypes. If they were not in blackface, would this routine even be considered negative or stereotypical? Let's watch and I'll let you decide. Now I love those eyes that shine Oh, I'm gone, yes, I'm gone With the love that's ever growing To that cone black mammy of mine Not a cent, not a cent And my clothes are only lent All the same, she'll think I'm just fine Oh, behind the barn, down on my knees Don't scare us what you heard I thought I heard a chicken sneeze Achoo! Polly, Polly, doodle all the day Fairly well, fairly well
video, we're supposed to think about what it was like right after the Civil War, up until about the end of World War I. Think about what it was like for the black performer or performers of other minorities trying to make it in mainstream America. So if you were a black performer during the century minstrel shows were popular, would you perform in blackface? Well, it happened, and it happened quite often. So let's take a moment to understand some of the reasons blacks began to do blackface. Well, first of all, obviously, it's going to be a more authentic representation of the culture behind the characters, but they still performed the same old stereotype routines, the same songs and dances, because basically, it sold tickets. And to make it as a performer, you have to make money. And the way they did it was ticket sales. But more about that later. The white performers who did minstrelsy um, did not really do black comedy at all. I mean, the jokes had nothing to do with blacks whatsoever. They were basically gags that were taken, and, and they, they were of um, show business origin. They were riddles and gags taken from uh, the northern stage. When blacks came in, you had the emergence of an authentic form of black entertainment, although they still veiled it with the stereotypes that had been set up by the white performers. So let's use our imagination. Imagine going to a theater to see a live show, but this is before the invention of the electric light bulb. What would it be like? Imagine sitting in the balcony, say the fifth row, and there's nothing but candles lighting the stage. What would that be like? How hard would it be to see the faces of the characters or to see who was speaking to whom? So here is a clip of a man named Leonard Reed and he's discussing various aspects of what it was like performing in blackface in both mainstream vaudeville and on a different circuit of vaudeville known as the Toba circuit. Notice what he says. He says, it's an act. Black face and white lips, it helped the audience to see the face and lips move around. And when the face and lips moved around, the audience would laugh. And that's what show business is all about, getting a laugh. I'll quote him as he says, show business is show business. The, the, the definition for acting is to do. All of this is an act. Leonard Reed is an African-American who played in both all-white and all-black vaudeville. I told you why they put on cork. Not to be black, but to get the expressions from the face. When you put on cork and white lips, you can move your lips around and everybody can see them moving around and that's a laugh. And I think anything that you can do to get a laugh should be in show business. Show business is show business. And I think that burnt cork for a lot of those vaudevillians was a mask so that when they came off stage they could disappear into the crowd and nobody would know who, who they were. Almost all the black comedians before 1950 wore blackface, even for black audiences. In the beginning they had to. So to bring the point home about black performers performing in blackface, let's meet one. Let's meet Pig Meat Markham. Pig Markham is one of the last African-American actors to remove the mask, to take off the black face. He performed until the 1900s, and you can see him in many early movies. So here is a clip of people who knew Pig who performed with Pig discussing his routine and how he felt about performing in blackface, even though he was a black man. Yeah, let me tell you about that bull of my father. You see, right but some now, wanted to, like the great comedian Dewey Pigmeat Markham. And that bull is so fast and so smart, every afternoon about 5 o'clock, he goes way up to the far end of that pasture and race that train five and a half miles. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Would you believe it? That bull beat that train by half a mile. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some bull. I know it's some bull. <laughs> and when Pigmeat took off his cork, he lost the edge that he had in laughter. I said, Pigmeat, what's happening? I said, the bit isn't going. He said, I don't know, I can't express myself anymore. He said, they made me take off the cork, and the cork was not to prove that I was black. They knew I was black. 
He said, but I, Negro, that's what he said, but I just lost the edge. I can't feel like I felt when I had the cork on. And he was broken hard until the end. Pig meat was broken hard until the end that he had to take off cork. Pig meat Markham was one of the last American performers to take off the mask. His fans were surprised to discover that his face was darker than his makeup. He had been lightening up, not blacking up, for 40 years. So minstrel shows. How did the minstrel show contribute to the genesis of jazz? Well, in my opinion, they provided a list of commonly known popular songs. Many of these songs are still well known today. However, much of the negative stereotypes have been removed by this point. These minstrel songs were commonly used by the first jazz musicians to experiment with this new jazzy sound they were creating. These songs became the first to have the four basic elements of jazz that we discussed and learned in video two. <laughs> 